Bend the knee. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Don Willie coming at you with another No Frills review. And if you're wondering why my eyes are on fire right now, it's because, you know, today I'm using the Baratheon words because mine is the damn fury. This is going to be my spoiler filled discussion for Game of Thrones. Season 5, Episode 6, Unbowed, Unbent, Unbroken. So, you know, we start off with Arya in the house black and white, and that was a cool scene. You know, she finally learns what it means to serve, but she still doesn't fully understand what it is that she's gotten herself into but she's finally learning and i'm glad that she's finally learning what this is and hopefully we can move on and and you know just get some of the book storyline you know get to see her do her thing as an assassin on the streets of bravos and learning how to play the game of faces better learning how to lie so she isn't getting whipped on by Jack and Hogar. And, you know, they threw in the nice little Easter egg of the waif, uh, you know, with the whole thing about her being the daughter of a noble house. Uh, now, whether or not this is still the same character, we're not sure yet because they haven't actually, they haven't actually said as to whether it is the same character or not. But, you know, we're led to believe it kind of is, right? Finally, she gets to go down in the Hall of Faces and see the different masks that the faceless men use, you know, after she has learned how to give the gift of mercy and actually lie to someone convincingly enough at least that Jack and Hogar is like, all right, you're on the right track. I thought that was kind of cool. He told her, you know, you're not ready to become no one, but you're ready to become someone else, at least. So we'll have to see what that someone else is. Maybe this will be the point where she starts to try on different personas, you know, uh, and go out into the streets and develop different backstories so that she can become you know, faceless men more convincingly. Because it may be that in order to actually become a faceless man, you have to be able, you know, maybe putting on one of the faces, you have to be able to sell that or else, you know, or else somebody will be able to see through the, uh, through the disguise. Next up, we get Tyrion and Jorah. Tyrion tells Jorah that his pops is dead and finally... You know, the two of them get to bonding just a little bit. You know, although Jorah still doesn't fully trust Tyrion, and, you know, rightfully so, Tyrion is a Lannister, but you would figure if Tyrion is looking all disheveled and he's, you know, looking all kinds of messed up, that, look, maybe you don't need to treat him with such hostility. He told you about your dad. And, yeah, he, look, man, he he had a point when he asked, what the hell does Daenerys know about ruling the Seven Kingdoms, you know? And I thought they were actually going to drop the story of them getting captured by slavers. I like the fact that uh, Tyrion was able to negotiate his way out of that situation, as Tyrion often does. That was a real cool thing. Um... But at least we didn't get Jorah being all whiny. Eh, well, 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 I'll never get to see Daenerys again. I'm sold into slavery. Because they're actually going to Marine. So, you know, Jorah will end up in fighting pits. And I'm pretty sure that won't be in episode 7. It'll be episode 8 or 9. We don't get anything from the wall. This time around, we don't get anything from Marine. We do go back to King's Landing where 
you know, Marjorie has enlisted Elena Tyrell. Elena is back in the city. She's going to talk to Cersei and basically is like, oh, look, you know, if you keep fucking with my family, I'm going to pull all support from, you know, from uh, Tyrell's side of things and it's going to be hell to pay for you. And Cersei just kind of hit it with the, listen, you know, do what you got to do. I don't really care. You know, I'm still Cersei Lannister. I run this. You know, does she sets up the, well, not that she sets up, you know, the, the fifth, sets up the trial for, or the inquest as to whether or not they're going to actually do the trial for Loras. And apparently, Loris has been locked away for, I would say, at least a month. You know, judging by uh, that beard that he has. And, you know, obviously, we, we see what the outcome of that is. And they changed it up a bit from the books, because in the books, pretty much the only one who's in King's Landing at that time that Cersei, that Cersei can't touch is Marjorie. And they decided, you know, ah, Cersei touched everybody, you know. Mace Tyrell is across the narrow sea trying to negotiate with the Bank of Bravos. Elena Tyrell is in a position where she can't really uh, just drop support of the Lannisters without making all-out war. Marjorie is now in prison along with along with uh, Loris, and not for the reason that it was in the book. And this time they decided, you know, to make Loris the more guilty party and and then take Marjorie down with him because she lied uh, under oath to the faith, you know. And now I'm wondering how no one else knows that this dude Oliver works for Littlefinger yet. I'm pretty sure that will... Um, that will come up at at some point later, and listen, you know. And in fact, now nah, from now on, we're not calling Peter Baelish Littlefinger. He is Peter Fucking Baelish. Okay, yes, he he would be the only dude with a middle name in the story, and his middle name is Fucking because you are going to get fucked over if you deal with Peter Baelish. Period. He. This is, dude, he is trying to start another war. Now, it's crazy because he tells Cersei, make me warden of the north. All in the meanwhile, while he's basically setting up a war between the Lannisters and the Tyrells. Hoping, I'm guessing, that the Tyrells can take out the Lannisters. But by then, he'll already have his royal decree as Warden of the North, you know, but his main prize, the one thing that he wanted to get, Sansa Stark, is now damaged, you know, and, and not even just physically, but she'll definitely be emotionally damaged now because instead of him doing his due diligence and saying, all right, well, you know, damn, um... This would be messed up if something actually does happen to Sansa. I'm like, look, I'm not sure that I think that he cares about Sansa at all. You know, I'm not sure that he cares about her at all because he put her in a, in a very fucked up position on multiple fronts. Because for one, you put her in the hands of the people who murdered her mother and brother. And... On top of that, you admitted that you don't know anything about Ramsey Bolton, this wild card, you know. So, you know, obviously that, that leads to what happens later on. And like I said, Peter Baelish right now, Peter Baelish officially has control of three very large regions of Westeros. Because, if I'm not mistaken, his seat at Harrenhal and being declared Lord Paramount of the Trident gives him control over the Riverlands. Um, you know, having Robin Aaron as his ward 
and him being Lord Protector gives him patrol um Lord Protector of the Vale gives him control over that region and then Cersei just made him Warden of the North by decree. So that means if you know or whenever we get the battle of Winterfell, if Peter Baelish is able to use the Knights of the Vale to mop up there, he would have control over the three northernmost regions of King's Landing. And that's three of the seven kingdoms, which means if he can get the rest of those people to rally behind them, behind him, and if he's able to get the Tyrells and the Lannisters to go to war, basically, he controls the whole thing. You know, because after the Tyrells and the Lannisters get finished, then who's left to to oppose him? Because he might not even care about Dorne. You know, he might not care about Dorne at all. You know, and by that time, if he has that many regions under his control, under his personal control, then, you know, it's, it's a thing of, well, who's going to stop him at that point, right? So now let's move to Winterfell. This was the craziest set of circumstances because, you know, you have Ramsey who's basically unhinged and he's, you know, running wild. And I say that only because, yo, Bruce Bolton knows what his son is like. But then again, look at what Roos did in order to even conceive Ramsey to begin with. So, you know, Ramsey is taking taking liberties because his father has taken all kinds of crazy liberties. And he knows his father isn't going to care that much, right? As long as they can keep the North under their control. We got Miranda basically, you know, telling Sansa what her and Ramsay actually did, but Sansa, you know, thinking that it's so much of a ploy that she doesn't believe in it. She just, she thinks, oh, you know, this is just a scare tactic and not, and not really realizing that, no, what Miranda was telling her was a real thing and that really she should have known better. Look at what... Look at what Ramsey did to Theon, and then look at how he had him acting when they were at dinner that one time, right? She should have known, and she chose, you know, to kind of ignore that because in her head, she's still, you know, even though she's learned stuff from, from Littlefinger, she hasn't learned enough to not, um, to not get herself caught up, Right? So, at the end of the day, she allowed herself to be played. Um, you know, we got the whole Theon thing where Theon is too scared to tell her the truth about what happened with him not actually killing her brothers. You know, and he's like, look, please, you got to go through with this because if not, you know, this dude is going to torture me again. And she's like, oh, I don't care what he does to you. Yeah, because she's thinking, oh, well, he'll do that to you. He won't do that to me. But wrong again, Lady Sansa. Wrong again. And, um, man, you know, that whole sequence with, um, with them doing the wedding, and then right after the wedding, straight to the bedding, and, you know, it was more brutal in the books, right? And, in fact, I was actually watching watching it with my mom. Uh, I got her in the Game of Thrones a little while ago, and now, you know, uh, whenever we hang out, we, we watch that together. So, we were watching that, and I was, when I saw that coming, I was like, oh, man, you're not going to want to watch this. So they actually made it less brutal in the show, you know, than how it was in the books. But damn it, that that doesn't mean that it wasn't still something crazy. Oh, before I forget, you know, let's talk about Jamie and Braun and Dawn. So it looks like Braun is Braun is the rap. This is the rap fan. It's done. You know, he didn't got cut by one of them sand snakes, and you can call it whatever you want to. 
But we already know those are Oberyn's daughters. Oberyn worked in poison. So I highly doubt that he's going to work in poison and not tell his daughters to do the same thing. And if you remember, Oberyn, you know, when he was 15, he had that duel with that high lord, the dude that was mad about him sleeping with one of his mistresses. He scratched the dude. Scratched him. A couple of weeks later, Summer's dead, right? Braun is a dead man. Uh, he ain't making it back to King's Landing. Yeah, he's not making it back to King's Landing. I think he's going to die on the road to King's Landing in a very horrible fashion, uh, you know, writhing in pain. You know, unless, unless by some strange luck of the draw, they happen to have a, uh, you know, a maester in Dorne who has the cure for for uh, that poison. Um, and that fight scene was all kinds of just ridiculous. It looked like a fight scene from season three of Arrow, which, uh, you know, season three of Arrow sucks. But, uh, yeah, that fight scene was just, um, just bad. Now, overall, I still like the episode. Don't, don't let my tone and, and my fiery eyes right now, uh, let you think that I didn't like the episode. I did like the episode a lot. I think it was still high energy. I think it moved the story forward. Um, I'm just kind of like... Man, I, I really, I didn't want to see that happen to Sansa. Peter Baelish, yo, listen, he is my favorite character, and I think, I'm, he's my favorite character, but I was still upset at him for, for doing what he did. I shouldn't be mad because we know who he is, but I was I was still like, damn it, man, really? You put her in that situation and then you sold her out. So, ah, uh, man. I don't know, man. Let me know your thoughts. What did you guys think about this episode? Uh, you know, I gave it a nine and a half when I talked to, to Donna Crack and Wit and LT Giles. I think, I mean, yeah, I know most people would say, oh, you can't go back and revise later on. But yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to pull it down to an eight. Um,. I think this does set up some some interesting stuff for later on. We'll have to see how it all turns out. But, you know, look, I know there's a lot of people, book readers, especially who are kind of like, oh, you're diverging too much from, from the books, blah, blah, blah. And Dan and Dave think they, they can do it better. I don't think it's that they think they can do the story better. I think it's they know they have to do it differently. They can't do the same story. It's not it's not logistically possible. I, I keep on hearing people say, oh well, they should just add more episodes. They can't HBO won't give them the money. They're spending almost a hundred million dollars per season as it is. HBO won't give them the money to make it, you know, to, to do anymore, okay? You know, if they already had it in their mind that they were going to do 10 seasons, then maybe they could have stretched out the story a bit and had more characters. But, you know, they're trying to finish it in a certain time for it to not be watered down too far. They've already had to distill it to, to the point that it's gotten to now to where, you know, we're getting storylines that are getting crushed together. And... Look, I I understand. Look, I would love to see some of the characters that were missing. I want to see Lady Stoneheart. I want to see the battle with uh, Strong Bellwars outside of Marine. You know, um, there's a bunch of stuff that I would love to see that we're probably not ever going to get to see. But then think about it like this, too. You know, because we don't have the Winds of Winter or Dream of Spring yet, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that we're going to get to see that either A, won't ever happen in the books, or B, will happen uh, before we get to the books, right? So, you know, the only thing I can say is, look, man, you know, you got to be patient with it and just take the show for the show and the books for the books. Anyway, you already know the drill. Rate, 
comment, subscribe, share, tell your friends, all that good stuff. Come back for more. And I will be back with some more videos later this week. That's been my time. Don Willie, I'm out. Yeah.